Hey, welcome, welcome everyone. This is a, the first uh, uh, LAVA online event. Um, as you can see, we have some great panelists uh, today. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, <clears throat> uh, LAVA, as you all uh, may know, um, I'm the new executive director uh, following in the footsteps of Len Lanzi. And um, LAVA's uh, goal is to support the venture ecosystem um, pretty much uh, to make it more efficient. Um, in that vein, we're looking to uh, bring some insights today, uh, specifically on um, taking your startup or a startup and looking at the EU as a possible market and how to make that uh, startup uh, sexier to investors and uh, hopefully also to customers. Uh, so we have a, a great panel today. I'm going to introduce uh, our two co-chairs of the Global Lava uh, Group. Uh, Michael McClune and Sharon Ray Binder, and I will let each of them uh, introduce themselves, and um, I'll turn it over to you guys. But thank you for attending today, Michael. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Michael McClune. I'm a co-chair with Sharon. Um, we are really excited to reanimate and uh, take this global uh, lava subcommittee. Uh, in greater Los Angeles and Southern California. And I'm, from what I understand, we have some uh, attendees around the world. Uh, this is gonna be one of many events that we have where we're going to help founders and funders get a clearer picture of how to go and expand and grow into uh, geo-specific markets based on the events. So this one is the EU and the UK and, and greater Europe, of course. And we'll be following with more events into the African market, uh, LATAM market, uh, Asia, and, um, and some other offshoots. So uh, it's, it's exciting. Sharon and I are, are, are excited to take the reins. I'll be the moderator today uh, with our three esteemed panelists and then uh, Sharon will come in and uh, she'll be collecting your, your questions and your inquiries as the uh, discussion goes along. And uh, she'll, she'll pose those to the panelists in the last uh, 15 minutes. So we'll have some intros here and then we'll talk for about uh, 30, 40 minutes and then we'll have a Q and A. So Sharon. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm taking a look at the chat. Uh, we have someone from Nigeria that's joined us. Uh, so I, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm uh, the director for North America of Invest in Grenoble Alps. So by day I attract US and Canadian companies uh, to the stellar high-tech Grenoble area and environs. Um, I am an active member in French Founders and part of the French Cluster team in LA. I'm on the LAVA board and in the Women in LAVA committee also. So today, I'm um, uh, thrilled to uh, be with Michael and launching this, uh, the Global Lava uh, events again. Uh, thanks to Darren and thanks to our speakers. And I'm also delighted to offer a sampling of one of uh, a fruit of another expertise of the Grenoble area, the nectar that is Chartreuse, made in the French Alps in the Chartreuse mountain range. So we will choose one lucky participant who is over 21 years of age and from the list of attendees to receive both flasks of green and yellow so that you can compare and contrast. So thanks everyone and I'll let Michael take it away. Sure, so I'll, I'll toast to the lucky winner right now as this is a happy hour. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the attendee from Nigeria must be one in the morning if I'm doing my math correctly. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, so my name is Michael McClune. I run, I help run the International Business Accelerator where we take uh, startups and, and uh, high growth companies and we catapult them into the foreign markets, uh, the global marketplace. We do it quickly, we do it compliantly and we make sure we do it profitably. So uh, in today's panel, we have uh, Brenda McCabe who is a, an American. However, she has extensive experience in Europe, leading companies as well as raising funds. Uh, we have Alfred, uh, who is a VC from France, so. and, and uh, James Cummings, who works for the mayor's uh, uh, accelerator for the city of London. So all three of them are based here in Los Angeles, but they all have extensive research and focus in the EU. So Brenda, you wanna introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with uh, this group today. Um, I'm, uh, as Michael said, I'm an American, although I spent most of my adult life living in Spain and Italy, um, working largely in McKinsey, um, some private equity, 
um, Big Pharma, as VP Strategy, AstraZeneca, and Digital Health, and Clean Tech. Um, I'm currently acting as CEO of an enterprise SaaS and software company, Matchbook Services. I, uh, it's a company that is based here in Los Angeles, and we are about $775,000 in, in sales, recurring revenue. We do have cross-border sales and clients. Um, I also will uh, speak a bit in some of the questions that have been prepared as a femtech uh, a, a angel investor. Um, and there's a European story behind that. I worked in pharma and digital health. Uh, so Ju Jubo Health is a company I'm invested in, I advise. And it is a platform that provides fertility education to couples that are on that journey. It's a met, it's an AI conversational bot that connects patients with, with um, doctors. And um, finally, a lot of my comments will be around regulated industries. So energy, clean tech, and digital health. Thank you. Excellent. Alfred? Yeah. Hi. Uh, and uh, nice being being here too, uh, sharing some uh, interesting point of view. Um, uh, as you can hear, I'm French um, with that, that strange accent. Sorry about that. Um, so um, uh, I primarily, before being a, a VC, I've been an entrepreneur for uh, 20 years, uh, starting in France and um, uh, first company that I sold and second one, uh, you know, there was, the first one was a purely French, second one was French at the, at the beginning, then European. Then um, I started the uh, um, European, uh, uh, the, the US entity, and then it, become, it became uh, a, a global company, became leader that was in the online publishing business on the tech vertical. Uh, so um, uh, we, um, and at the end, we took over the leadership of the US player uh, that was, uh, who, which was CNET. Uh, and um, so I've, I got that full, you know, uh, experience starting from France and uh, becoming a global leader through the U.S. Um, it was not an easy play, uh, and um, and then based on that experience, uh, I thought it was very interesting to uh, to build a, uh, a venture fund that would be kind of a mix of a venture fund and a growth accelerator to uh, try to give the keys to enter to European entrepreneur when they deserve to uh, start a US development to become global through the US because this is so different. So uh, a lot to, to say today regarding the topic. James, brilliant. Well, talk about your free and confidential expertise. <laughs> That's it. That's a good starting point. And thanks to Darren, Michael, uh, Sharon, and Alfred and Brenda as well. So I'm James. I work for London and Partners, which is the Mer which is London's international trade promotion and investment agency. So, you know, we're, we're a public-private partnership. About half our funding is from the Mayor of London. And to be honest, we, we do a number of things as an organization. But I think I've got one of the best jobs because I get to do help create and curate and celebrate really the links between London and the rest of the world. So I leave London and Partners LA office, uh, really working to support especially US companies, companies in, in LA and throughout the West that are looking to expand and open offices in London. And also equal, equally work with very exciting scaling companies from London that are exploring opportunities in the US. So I think it's the greatest job because every day I get to you know, speak about all the cool things happening in London, all the great things happening in LA and throughout the US, and really try to bring them together. And our end goal is to help, uh, you know, companies set up and begin operations and, and hopefully be successful in both those markets in London uh, and, and the US. And of course, from London, often companies use it as a launch pad to the rest of Europe and often the rest of the world as well. So really pleased to be here. And uh, thanks so much, Michael and everyone else. Yeah, well, that's a great, great panel here. Um, so for everyone uh, listening, we're going to flow this. Uh, we're going to talk about the internal structure and the facets to be vigilant of as you go into the European market. And then we'll look at the external approach and strategies that you'll need to go 
<clears throat> excuse me, into the uh, European market from more of Alfred's view or, or James' view. So we'll do the internal and the external, and then we'll get into the financial part of it, the dollars and the cents and the euros and the, and the cents. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll go a little bit more into alternative funding opportunities and resources. And then if we have time, we'll talk about the general landscape. And uh, if we're lucky, we'll see who's the new leader in Europe. We'll, have, we'll, we'll pit the Frenchman against the Brit <laughs> and see if it's uh, post-Brexit or, or France is now the leader in, uh, in uh, helping startups with uh, foreign direct investment. So um, that brings us to our first question. And you know, this, is, this is for James. What does a company have to have you know, fortified in their own market, in their own domestic market, you know, in this case being mostly US, but you know, Nigeria as well, or, or around the world, to be ready for cross-border expansion. So you have a free confidential service. Obviously, you can't give that expertise and all those services to everybody who contacts you. What are the criteria that you're looking for that makes you think, okay, this entity and this founding team can be competitive here? And you know, what do they need to have in their you know, internal operations before they think? About using yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. You know, companies here that, you know, how, how do we work out who, who will be best suited to the London European market? Uh, uh, and, you know, I think there, there are lots of things to be considering. And we, we want to work with companies at early stage because we want to help them drive this international growth strategy. And what I would say is that, you know, what, what we love, especially in LA and the West Coast, but from around the world, is when companies you know, we all know that LA is full of creative energy. And honestly, we, we love that in London. And, and I think that's kind of, you know, before talking about, you know, the, the teams or the resource, that creative energy that drives West Coast companies, we love it in London and the UK and Europe. And, and I think in London, it's because it, London mirrors it. You know? So I think that is really fundamental. You know, you've got to have that creative energy uh, and showcase it and bring it to Europe. But, you know, and there are lots of things to consider, uh, you know, internally, you know, when, when looking at which markets are right for you, you know, the US and North America is a massive market. So how do you decide when it is right for you and your team? And how do we work with companies to make sure that we're helping them build that internal resource? So, you know, do your employees have experience working in Europe, selling in Europe? You know, it, it is a different environment. You know, who are your customers here? Do they have a presence in Europe? You know, perhaps they can help you to bring you to Europe if they need your product, your service, your technology in London. Uh, and also, you know, what, do, what, do, what does your sector look like in London? What, what are the challenges and opportunities? So it's really about, have you done your due diligence internally to help you understand what doing, in business, doing business in London, the UK and Europe will really look like? You know, because there are differences. Contracts are different. Hiring employees or contractors are different. The PEO model, which is very common in the US isn't viewed quite the same in the UK. So it needn't be burdensome or you know, difficult to set up an entity to do business, to look at the UK or Europe for funding, but you, know, it, you have to do your due diligence. You have to go through the questions, which you know, it's like starting again, really, in many respects. And you know, there are some things that take longer. You know, hiring employees takes longer. Getting a bank account takes longer. Uh, but you know, I think at the moment, you know, we're, we're kind of, moment is kind of a great equalizer because everyone is working remotely at the moment you know it is a great level of for international companies moving into other markets because we're all cloud-based we're all remote so if you u.s companies or international companies want to move into europe now is the time to to kind of do it because you know people aren't meeting up in the same way you know people are on zoom so if you're internally ready to deal with that if you've got employees that are experienced at doing that if you've done your due diligence or aware of the challenges and opportunities, you know, now is a great time to do it really. And especially if you can set yourself up internally to, to, to kind of to, to service Europe. So, you know, do you have a European focused website? Are you doing social that focuses on, on Europe? You know, have you got a phone number? If, if you need a phone number that is in the UK. So, if, you know, you look and sound like a European company. And of course that's different around the regulations and, and legalities of doing business in Europe. But if you've got all these things set up, like privacy regulations, well, if you've thought about all these stuff, now is actually a pretty good time to do it because, you know, we, 
we're in, you know, people on this call, I'm sure around LA, around California, around the world, in Nigeria, and in the UK. I mean, now, but how do we know? Because we're all on one Zoom call. So now might be an interesting time to do it. This sounds to me, it's a lot more perspective and mindset with attention to detail. What, what do you think, Alfred? Um, you know, I feel that, um, if you want to, um, topic is how, um, uh, you need to understand exactly where the, of course, so let's start from the basics. Um, of course, if you think about going to Europe, uh, it's because you are really successful in the U S you know, and then you have your you know, uh, your secret sauce, is, secret sauce is, is obvious. You have the uh, growth, uh, market fit, uh, whatever. Um, so, and you feel it's time to go there um, before uh, having anybody else uh, doing it before you do it at some point. It's, it's probably the, the point. So as soon as that, that is obvious to me. Uh, so then the question is, uh, first of all, um, if, uh, you really need to uh, to to get a deep deep understanding of uh, the EU, the EU uh, complexity uh, because EU is so different, right? As it is for us when we we want to penetrate the US market, e EU is 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 a different market, is a different regulation, uh, and uh, with different countries into it, with different regulations into it. It's not like US, you know, with um, uh, one fail <laughs> uh, that 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 goes over mainly uh, the, the, the 50 states. So uh, that's very very different. Uh, language languages are different. Uh, culture uh, management, I mean, goes with the culture. Um, so it's, it's so different, you know, think about, you know, talking about uh, management. Recently, you know, uh, Uber uh, fired um, um, some, some, you know, a, a chunk of employees through using Zoom, which in the US is fairly okay, very pragmatic, right? In Europe, it it's <laughs> it's uh, that that was that was uh, um, that was an issue. Uh, you know, it's 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 not the way it works. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying you know, it's it's a different culture. So, um, so then the point uh, thinking about that is, what's going to be the 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 you know the con the, the first country you're going to choose to uh, for your headquarter for Europe. Um, so what's the, you know, it's, it's a full process. Um, and, uh, and obviously, um, that's what I like the, the topic, because what you're saying, you, you're talking about, you know, uh, how you could raise funds for a U.S. startups, uh, raising fund uh, in Europe with U European VCs, which at some point, you know, doesn't make sense because you say, hey, you have in the US the best in class VCs, right? So why would you raise some money in Europe uh, knowing that if you're successful in the US, uh, money coming from VCs is not, is, it, it, it shouldn't be the issue, right? So, but um, in my eyes, it makes tons of sense because, because then you have uh, part of your shareholders that truly understand the, the, the uh, uh, what is Europe? Uh, what does it mean? Does your business plan make sense? Um, uh, so uh, the, you're regarding your expectation and so on. And then the way you should pick that uh, that that European VC is is all about uh, you know getting smart money, making sure you're getting a VC that's going to be fairly hands-on, you know, uh, ready to help. Um, in different, in many ways, uh, because um, you know you need you need network, you need to be help for recruitment, you need uh, you need to adapt your go to market strategy, uh, you need to adapt your storytelling, uh, you need to get you know best in class advisors uh, to help you in in different countries, making sure your strategy is the, is the right one and so on. So. Um, so for me, um, that, that all those topics need to need needs to be covered, and but if first of all, if that is clear for you, if uh, for you, 
um, going to Europe is not just a copycat of what you've done successfully in the US, uh, then um, that's, that, that's if, you, if a European VC gets the point that um, you, you got that point, you, this is crystal clear for you that you're gonna need help, you're gonna need to really adapt everything, uh, it's the first good step because it's not that usual. Uh, you know, uh, America is that big. So uh, usually uh, you have that typical US mindset saying, okay, so I'm ready. <laughs> Let's just do the copycat and, and that'd be fine. Uh, if you feel the, 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 the managers are, uh, it's crystal clear for them that that needs to be done. That's a first fantastic step for a European VC and that's a great opportunity. Uh, them for European VCs because uh, being able to invest into a um, very successful U.S. company um, and to for, for helping them. So at some point they're going to get a great deal for helping them in Europe. But at the same point, at the same time they're going to get uh, you know the the uh, the benefit of the global entity. It's, it's a pretty good deal usually for those VCs that are starting to do it. And it's a trend. More and more VCs are getting the point that they could be very helpful and that could be a great deal. All right, excellent. So from James, I heard, uh, you know, it's the perspective and the preparation. Alfred, I thought you might talk more about, uh, <clears throat> you know, metrics and benchmarks and, you know, re repeating sales and more of a financial. But it sounds like you're saying it's all about the adaptation. Yeah. Um, Brenda, because, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, but because I, I did I didn't talk about that because it's it's the same you know whatever it's uh, it depends on what what is your business but obviously uh, Europe and US are not that different you know uh, looking at you know growth and it depends you know if it's a SaaS business whatever you're gonna your your CAC and uh, uh, whatever uh, so. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's the way you th th there's nothing that different all right well i think i saved the best for last and by the way thank you james and alfred you covered the first two questions pretty much in the same very uh, efficient startup like um mm -hmm. brenda I'm, I'm eager to hear <clears throat> what you have to say uh your two cents both the dollar sense and the euro sense <laughs> from a bilateral um you know perspective based on your experience well, I think as a U.S., I think James mentioned it as well. I mean, the U.S. market is so uniform and it's so large. I think any European investor will want to see that you are, you've got product market validation, right? And, and some traction. And in today's world, again, working remote, the power of getting eyeballs on your website and using social media, even if in your, you're in a regulated industry or, or SaaS, um, it, you can actually understand behavior on your website of potential partners and, and, and VCs and the like that are actually out looking at you. So I think European investors, if you're coming from the US, first of all, you will want to have at least proven your product market fit, right? And have some traction. In terms of, um, I'm coming at this again in the digital health world. You want to be in a very large market. There's nothing like TAM, right? Um, I can speak specifically to Jubal Health. Um, we're in the fertility space, started in preconception, and everybody has babies across the world, right? And there just so happens to be a really large and reputable institute in Spain that is is the leading uh, uh, institute in um, fertility. And uh, just, I think another, so, so basically we did get an investor from Europe who liked one, the market we're in and, and the size. And having babies, while it might be language differences, the clinical side is pretty similar. So it's scalable. Um, so they like that. Um, that's a specific case. I think the other thing that you should keep in mind, and I didn't hear my colleagues say this, is how I operate and I found it very useful while as an executive at a startup in clean tech, very capital intensive, you and regulated industry, you want to have advisors, perhaps that's the, the office of the mayor of London, but some, reg, some law, some legal advice, perhaps a CPA, 
Um, there are a lot of uh, these, you know, X KPMGs or EYs, not to talk about logos and spe specifically, but you want some pretty smart people on the ground that are relatively um, inexpensive to hire to be your partners and kind of anticipate any red flags, all right? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you had an investor <clears throat> Uh, from Spain, yes. and I think it was, I think you had mentioned a story about uh, you had taken some money from the U.S. federal government, but there were some intellectual property issues that the Spanish investor was wary about. Um, you know, my my question is really, what are the practicalities and the nuances of taking investment from Europe, you know, versus here? I know Alfred said it's, it's very similar, but I mean, are there other expectations? Like if Alfred, if you cut a million dollar check for a company that already has a million dollar here, investment here in the U.S., are their behavior, is the behavior expected to be a little bit different? Uh, is the duration of the money and the runway different? Um, I mean, you said you'd like to see them go to the bank and get some debt first while they have that leverage because they already have a million dollars. Why not go get more for cheap? Um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so there's... Uh, the only main difference I would, you know, in terms of behaviors and expectations is probably uh, mm -hmm. uh, that the U.S. usually is more, a bit more aggressive in terms of uh, businessmen. You know, they are, the expectation are, you know, uh, that goes with the large market that, that is in the U.S. So usually you can see a kind of a gross expectation or higher than, than what you can usually see in Europe. So uh, that, that's, that's the, 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 the only difference in terms of expectation looking at a business plan. Um, uh, then um, behaviors are a bit different because um, uh, usually, um, you know, uh, government are a bit more, um, you know, uh, active in, in Europe. Um, uh, not sure it's the same in UK, James, but <laughs> you're gonna tell us. But, uh, um, but uh, it is, uh, so uh, for example, you were talking, Michael, about, uh, about debt. Yeah, as a VC, this is what we recommend. As soon as you raise money you uh, uh, to, uh, f from VCs, uh, that means you are full of cash and that's the perfect moment to um, to get some additional debt, which are non dilutive uh, vehicles, which is great currently because the cost of the debt currently is, is super low. So uh, definitely that's what we are, we, we encourage big time uh, startups to do, to do that. And in Europe, uh, it's probably easier right now um, to, to get that specifically in France, you have, you know, you have a lot of money that you can you can get from, uh, you know, you have the sovereign fund in 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 France, the BPI, uh, which is which is super active. It's active on the into the VC ecosystem, but investing directly into startups, but also uh, super active in terms of grants and loans all over the place. And it could be, you know, at the, the country level, but it could it could be also in regions. Um, so you have. You have a lot to get, and um, it's definitely something that you need to consider, and that is very attractive uh, when you are, you know, considering the different countries you could get in. Uh, considering that is, is very, very meaningful. Um, we we could talk a bit later, probably uh, also about the kind of of also kind of you know regarding the taxes and and the grants you could get also on on innovation uh, that's very specific to france uh, but to, because not not specific to france but france is even more active in terms of uh, grants for innovation so if you want to build uh, you know tech teams uh, in france for example it, it's currently people they, they don't know enough about that because uh, it's it's a real opportunity you have tons of talents but at the same time, you know, you can get, you know, grants, loans, uh, tax uh, reduction, uh, and even if you don't, um, uh, you, you you don't pay tax, uh, you can get a refund of those uh, tax intensive uh, incentives. 
So um, it, it, it is very, very interesting and there's a lot to do. I was talking a lot about France, but it's, it's fairly common in the, the, the main countries in Europe uh, to see that. Probably, uh, Brenda, you, 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 could, you, could, you could confirm based on the, your experience in Spain and, and Italy. Right. I, I think the, the war story that Michael teased out the other day in, prepare, in preparation for this cause, we were in a Series B raise. Uh, so we'd already raised over $80 million in a pretty capital intensive um, uh, device for solar uh, energy. And uh, the Southern European countries had a very nice tariffs, um, which made it a very interesting launch market. We have went so far as to seek a, a, um, a uh, tax, that uh, was actually a grant to have manufacturing in the south of Spain, um, everything was signed. A million euros was deposited in our account. They had not yet closed, I think, on um, one of the last investors in the Series B, and the, they got gun shy. They did not want to have debt of a, for, of a, of, of a sovereign country um, on the books. Um, I got the phone call from the CEO and had to return the money. So I think at that later stage, when you're raising so much money, um, some investors are more gun shy. However, I have another example in the US, I don't know whether I'm jumping guns, uh, Michael, but SBIR grants the largest seed fund in the United States is uh, non-dilutive funding, relatively easy to get $225,000 up front to preclinical or even actually for technology. And I would encourage early stage companies to, to go to those uh, funds if you, if you haven't. Um, there's a, the, 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 it's, it's not a lot of money. Um, it gets you, if you still don't have an, an MVP, it gets you a long way. And, it's, and it's, there's three calls a year um, for applications. It, it's good. It's good to to. Uh, it's a good point to give some examples. Uh, I'm going to give you one. So what I didn't say as a, as a VC, we're you know we're investing. Uh, you know we're cutting check between five to uh, to third thirty million uh, euro um, at a uh, Series A, B, or C level. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, and uh, so so the kind of uh, the, if I look at one of the, our last investment. Uh, this is uh, this is a pure uh, tech uh, software company uh, in the travel industry. Um, we uh, made uh, with two other funds. We made a thirty million investment, uh, but right after that, um, so uh, we we got uh, a loan uh, um, of uh, seven million. Um, and we've got also, which is a mix of a loan and a grant from the, the sovereign fund uh, uh, on innovation, we got 3 million on top of that. Uh, and, and then uh, talking about the cost, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the research expenses, uh, R&D, um, just so you know, in France, we can get up to 30% uh, of tax deduction. Uh, uh, so 30% of the cost that could be tax deductible, uh, uh, but it, it, or refunded if you're not paying tax at the end. So, so um, if you get all all that, it's. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, I mean, it's it's a big. It's a, you know, at the end, uh, it's a lot of money. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think you know, working with it's important to really understand the opportunity in the market and what the incentives are. So you know, much of the UK has an R and D tax credit, and you don't have to have employees in the UK in order to claim it. But at the end of the day, you can get 33 percent cash back. You know, from HMRC, Her Majesty Revenue and Customs, the equivalent of the IRS for. R&D that you put through the, the, the UK. So it's really interesting to know that. And the other thing I think, depending on the sector, it's, it's, it's important to, to, from an incentives perspective, really understand the market you're going into. You know, where is the government putting incentives? What, what, what's driving the economy? What do they want the future of that market to look like? 
So in the UK, there's the industrial strategy, and that looks at a number of different areas of the economy where, where they want the UK to really be world leading. So that will often mean that there are competitions, there are grants, there are funding, there are uh, organizations like the Catapults in the UK, and I'm sure it'll be the same in other European um, markets. And the Catapults bring together you know, the, the research community, academic, academia, startups, SMEs, the research and funding institutions, the corporates, and they'll run competitions, you know, because they're looking to make sure that their markets are, are world leading in that space. So how do you, you, you know, and working with, you know, VCs, professional service advisors, which is crucial. I can't remember if Alfred or Brenda said that is, is really important. Uh, working with uh, Lava, working with the International Business Accelerator, working with London and partners, working with the consulates in LA or around the world of the city that, or sorry, country that you're looking to enter. These are all ways in which you can understand what the challenges and opportunities are in those markets, where they're driving their economy. And if you have a product or service or technology that, that helps enable that growth in that market, it's likely that you'll be able to access those funding opportunities, those grants, those competitions. And also that's a great way of meeting partners in those markets. You know, it's a great way of meeting the corporates who are also working towards those opportunities, or meet the other startups who could be potential partners for you meet the funding, meet the uh, research institutions, universities. So that's a really good way of, of looking at new opportunities, you know, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure pretty similar across Europe as well. Yeah. I'll interrupt. Yeah. I'll just interrupt, Michael. Is that okay? I'm going to sure. ask one of the questions from the audience because it plays into the, I, I just heard that you didn't have to be necessarily, you didn't have, have to have employees in London to get some of these incentives. And there's a question about, um, is it simply an urban myth then that startups need to be physically proximate to their VCs or other investors? So would representatives of the offshore capital be enough to fulfill said proximity needs? Does anybody have an answer to that one? I mean, from the, from the UK for our R&D tax credits, I mean, you, you, do, you, you potentially need to transfer some IP to the UK, but mm -hmm. there are things to do that and happy to, you know, to continue that discussion. I think, you know, you have to look at the market carefully as well. I mean, for, for the, 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 and I don't want to jump, I know we were talking, maybe talk about it later if we get time, kind of the differences between France and UK and Germany and Spain. I mean, I think for the UK, it's very easy to set up an entity and to hire someone in that entity so, you know, I, I don't, of course, there are all the things that we need to think about that Brenda and Alfred and we've all touched on earlier. But, you know, I don't think it's something, I mean, we could work, you know, you have to work out the cost, you have to work out your resource, you have to work out the ability to, to, to service that office, to really work with that office. Do you, what you want, don't want to do is hire someone and then lead them to it and not provide them the support. It's, you know, you've got to make sure that your company is resourced to support that person. But I think it's an option that should be on the table and, you know, it needn't be particularly complicated. I mean, of course, as Alfred said at the beginning, each market is different. They have different employment regulations, HR regulations, tax structures. So you have to be careful and you have to look at it carefully. But there's lots and lots of guidance and support out there to, to help you make that decision. So I have a question for you guys. You know, as Americans, we, we have big stomachs, both literally and figuratively. Um, and so, you know, if we're, if we're LA based startup and we're looking to go to Europe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think UK's GDP is roughly the same as California, right? Um, uh, France, maybe a little less, but is there an expectation whether you're taking private money from someone like Alfred or you're doing a knowledge transfer partnership in the UK? Is there an expectation that that will be the gateway to the rest of the European Union and Europe as a whole? Or is the expectation you're going to come into that market and thrive there and the rest of the EU is, a, is an afterthought. Oh, and, and one, one other thing to our attendees, we did put a poll up because we're curious uh, what sector you guys are representing so we can tailor the, uh, the rest of the conversation maybe towards you. But uh, James, can you continue? I mean, is there expectation that in your case, London or in, in a bigger picture of the UK, that that's going to be the launching pad or, or the gateway to the rest of the, the continent or not so much? Certainly that's how we, how we talk about London. You know, it is a launch pad to the rest of Europe, you know, and, and from a very practical standpoint, you know, 250 languages, nearly 300 languages spoken in London, you know, six airports, the Eurostar, uh, you, you know, it, it's a diverse economy. It's the diversity of its people, diversity of its economy means that 
you know, it, it is a good starting place for Europe, especially because the HR regulations, the employment regulations, you know, whilst not at will, like we have here in the US, they're, they're kind of friendly. The system of law is recognizable often to, to US companies coming over to London and of course the language as well. Uh, I think you have to, you know, you have to think carefully about where the opportunity is, you know, how you're going to approach the market. And, but what I would say is, and we can talk about, you know, the European Union and, and the UK's relationship with Europe as well. Uh, but, you know, I don't think you should, as Alfred mentioned earlier, you know, they all have their different uh, strengths, peculiarities, uh, different ways of working. You know, they have their different employment regulations. They have different tax structures. They have different, uh, you, you know, rules on many aspects of doing business. So, you know, you do have to think carefully about, uh, it's not necessarily just coming over to Europe and, and, you know, of course, Europe is a massive market and it's a very important market, much like the US and North America is. Uh, but, yeah, but we very much see London as a launch pad to the rest of Europe. But, uh, you know, look, there are obviously uh, benefits from depending on your business, depending on your structure, depending on what kind of market you're going after, what sector you're approaching. There are, uh, you know, you have to think carefully about which market in Europe might make sense. Brenda, yeah. when you took growth capital, oh, sorry, Alfred. When you, Brenda, when you took growth capital, was there an expectation that it was going to do the HQ in Spain and you were going to conquer the rest of the world or, or any other countries you, you're in? Or was it, let's start regional and see what happens because we, are, we want to own this, this domestic market? I think the growth capital came in because there was, and we did want to have a beachhead in Southern Europe. Um, the, it was a, kind of a suite. Um, loan. Um, however, it was regulated industry. So they, they, we were going to grow our presence in all of Southern Europe from there. Um, what happened though, um, Chinese solar panels were coming in, dropping the market price incredibly. Um, the Spanish government changed overnight the tariffs and um, were sued in European courts and a lot of people lost their shirt. We subsequently, so again, we, the initial idea was beachhead in Southern Europe to support um, all of the, the Southern markets because you need a lot of sun and actually Morocco and Israel. And um, in the end, what we did was uh, I moved to Italy. There were no more subsidies and Israel. And we went eventually, not all startups end happily, we raised another 80 million, um, went to chapter 11, but the Israelis bought the US company. So, and that's still a going concern. So there was a happy ending in the end, but it was, it was carnage in the, in the meanwhile. Mm -hmm. Alfred, did, were you gonna say something? I was just, just, uh, uh, I, I agree with uh, with James on the fact that you need to pick the the, 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 the right country. So the first, and you know, there's a competition right now in Europe on, you know, uh, because of the Brexit even more, there was always the, the, the case, but even more regarding the, the Brexit, um, you know, everybody's starting to, to be the launch pad of Europe, you know, hey, come here. Uh, but, but the way you should consider it is what's gonna be your first market? Because it doesn't mean, you know, uh, I would first consider, yeah, let's try, you know, if you pick one country, uh, try to be successful there and then expand. Um, so uh, so that's, uh, that's the way you, that's one of the key steps. And, uh, and then because you, so if you pick that country, it's for some reasons. Uh, and then uh, uh, you're gonna check the environment uh, of everything, you know, all we were talking about regulation and so on and so on. And all that stuff is really, uh, changing right now. So, uh, um, you know, uh, everybody, as I was saying, because of the Brexit even more. So look at France that is really well known, as you were saying, James, uh, as being, you know, on a HR standpoint, being, you know, uh, really conservative, not at all at will. <laughs> and, um, and it is, it, it, it changed uh, already pretty, pretty uh, nicely. Uh, Macron is, do is doing an amazing job on that standpoint. Um, and uh, and again, a lot of stuff. For for example, what 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 was uh, what is very specific to France recently? Why you have uh, America that is avoiding getting uh, 
you know, uh, that is limiting the numbers of visa uh, to have, you know, foreigners coming. I'm not talking about COVID, right? Before COVID, uh, uh, about about a, a, a full limitation of getting new uh, foreigners into the country. This is the opposite with France. Uh, you have the French the French tech visa. Uh, you could get a visa um, in less than two weeks. We've seen some in eight days. And if you get the visa, automatically the visa is, is uh, uh, apply for all your family. Uh, so, um, so that's the, the kind of stuff. So just an example um, to say that everything is changing right now. So you need to look at it carefully and not staying on old fashioned, you know, stories. And, and uh, so, um, but again, there's a uh, regulation on that one. But, but then first of all, I would, I would consider it as a market and, uh, and making sure if you pick that as a first market, making sure it would be then a good launch pad for, for Europe. I'll jump in maybe with a question. Is that okay, Michael? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have a question regarding performance metrics that might be sought for European investors looking at, at LA startups. Does the startup need to bring value to the investor's home market to be an attractive investment? Uh, not necessarily <laughs> yeah you know you need to again uh, you need to demonstrate there's a market and if you're if you're able to replicate what was uh, your your success on your uh, home home uh, market uh, that's 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 uh, the main thing we we want to see yeah. okay let's um Take more of a fun question before we open it up to uh, more Q and A. Um, you know, in, in our accelerator, we we don't play favorites. Uh, it, it's really the quite literally the market fit. You know, where's the best opportunity? Um, you know, but oh, things are always popping up. Like uh, Hungary, I think their tax rate is eight percent. So you know, people are always asking, should we HQ in, in Hungary? Or I should say that Bulgaria, is, I think, is 9%, but it's actually, in the end, less tax you're going to pay in Bulgaria than Hungary. But anyway, so they're, you know, they're always asking these questions of, you know, can I skirt this and how efficient can I, can I be with that? Um, you know, and, and, you know, Brenda, going into Italy and Spain, is there a lifestyle choice there <laughs> for, for an easier life? Or, or maybe the south of France, Alfred? Um, you know, versus versus the big metro areas, or, or is it, you know, how important is talent in the big cities? What, what do you guys think? And, and, and where should you stay away from? <laughs> as far as, as, far as <laughs> corruption and, and just general hassle. Yeah, they don't let Americans in in Spain, so. <laughs> um, I think work-life balance in the Mediterranean countries is um, is a bit more amenable to a balanced life. Um, you work hard, you work really long hours, but you play hard. Um, I believe over the years, actually, uh, with the European community, uh, the Spanish um, bank was uh, actually the software for the VAT clearance between countries is, um, is used for all countries. So, I mean, there's some really good tech in Spain. Um, it used to be known as a very unproductive country. I have to say that the processes in a digitalized world, um, everything's, you could do it online. Um, but the work-life balance in climates where you have a lot of sun, that's why I settled here in LA, right? It's, uh, it's more amenable. Mm -hmm. And you have the infrastructure, there's money, um, you have two large cities, Madrid and Barcelona. Um, in Rome, I'd say Italy is, is not as advanced uh, in terms of infrastructure compared to Spain. And I lived in Italy for two years. And so, so would a Londoner or a Parisian or you know, someone from Moscow, are they going to look differently at a company that's out of Spain? Or is it or is it negligible? Or Spain or Italy or a less developed, more relaxed culture? Well, I'll just, 
the largest construction company that does highways and toll roads, ACS, um, Ferroviaria, they just won a huge toll road in, in the state of Maryland, um, in the United States. So I think in today's world, we're seeing I mean, it's globalized and you see some of the top players that are independent of where they're from are, are able to win contracts over here and vice versa. So I think I they're in, largely in infrastructure projects, regulated industries, you're seeing who the winners are, right? I, 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 I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, 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 but you know, for, for about that few, uh, few insights on my, my, on my end. Uh, first of all, I would pick the, you know, coming to Europe is already fairly complicated. As I said, you know, it's a, it's a mix of countries. Um, uh, so I would first, you know, pick the largest market, um, you know, instead of thinking about taxes and, uh, you know, because if you, if, if this is a subsidiary coming from the US, you're going to keep your IP in the US more or less. So, so the tax impact at the end won't be that much, even if you're going to have to, to play well with the transfer pricing and so on. But uh, so I, I would really pick the largest market because uh, they are the most the, the advanced, developed, and it's going to be easier and it's it's already a stretch coming from the us uh you know even the largest market are small market comparing <laughs> compared to the us uh and and so uh that's that's what i i would i, I would uh, that would be the, the the guidance also this is because the more or less even if that is changing too uh po you know the the politic environment is more stable um uh, you were picking a Hungary, you know, you never know <laughs> yeah, what's going to happen there at the end. So what could be true today, you, you never know what's going to be tomorrow. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, that's, that's the other point. And, uh, and at the end, lifestyle, uh, of course, it's part of the, it's part of the deal. Same in the US at some point, you know, from, you know, being headquartered in New York, in, in, in LA, in the, the, the Silicon Valley, in Seattle, in, in Atlanta, it's, it's, it's different. It's different for, it depends on, on your industry, but, but there's a bit of a lifestyle into it and on a cultured fit. So, so at some point you need to enjoy when you go there, it's part of the deal. Uh, and, uh, and, and the last comment is, I would, <laughs> uh, a, you know, coming from the US, um, I feel that uh, the cultural fit will would be much easier on the northern part still of Europe, because south of you of Europe, it's 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 an additional stretch, you know. It's uh, the the way you work is very different. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had two subsidiaries, for example, I'm French, but I had this, two sub different subsidiaries in different companies uh, in Italy, one in Milan, one in Rome. Um, it's, it's just, it has nothing to do. It's, it's, it's not comparable and doing business in Roma, <sighs> frankly, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. They, they, you know, the, the, the way they behave, the way they, the, whoever you, you doing business with could be trustable. Uh, frankly, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a different game. Milan it's much more comparable to that typical Anglo-Saxon play. Uh, even if you're in Italy, it's, it's, it's so much easier uh, to do business, uh, you know, there, uh, if you go to Italy. So the more you go, you go south, uh, the more you could be surprised uh, uh, on, on a lot of sense point, even if uh, the lifestyle and, you know, I have to say the lifestyle in Roma compared to Milan, Roma is, is unbelievable, unbelievable, but keep it for, uh, for uh, holidays. <laughs> I would recommend. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, why are you coming to Europe? It's to win business and it's yeah. to find talent. And that's really got to drive your decision making. I mean, I, I don't think it's really about government incentives. It's about where are you going to Sales. Where are you going to hire the right people to do that? And, you know, whilst it's really important to look at the tax rates and you know 
UK is a very attractive tax rate. You know, but it's not as low as Ireland. But you know, what's the bigger market? You know, where are you going to win business, and where are you going to be able to to build your business? Where are you going to find the right talent? So, you know, really at the end of it, isn't that what it comes down to? You know, it's it's less about worrying about. I mean, of course, you you know, you want somewhere that you can access easily that has a good lifestyle that you know you'll be able to enjoy. You know, weekends. Uh, evenings you know it's all so important but you know you're, you're going over to Europe to to find business to find customers and to find the talent that will help you deliver that so uh, that's I think what, what's critical uh, when thinking about that and also to find out where your peers are as well I mean you, you know there are, uh, there are a million Americans that wake up and go to work every day for British companies and a million in the other way, British companies, well, Brits that go to work for American companies, Americans that go to work for British companies. So, you know, this is a tried and trusted route. And that's going to be the case. You're going to find US companies in Dublin, in Paris, in many of the cities that we've talked about. But, you know, you, you, want, to, you want to go down a route where people will recognize that, that you know, your approach, your, the way you operate will be understood and will be welcomed in, in that market, really. It, it won't be a, a, it shouldn't be a battle as long as you've done your due diligence, you've got a product that is, has a market fit. Everything that, you know, Brenda and Alfred and, and everyone's spoken to, about today, you know, but in the case of market, are you going to sell? Mm -hmm. Never, never minimize the cultural gap, please. Never minimize. Uh, this is, this is so meaningful. At some point, we look the same. We're not. We, we're just not the same. So the cultural gap is massive, and you can't you can't tell in in an hour of a meeting. You, you would say, oh, well, it's fine. Everything looks good. At the end, we're so different. So so the point, you know, again, looking at Northern Europe and sales, even if it it is changing, as you were saying, Brenda, uh, it, it is it is changing. But uh, you know the, the Cultural gap is going to be, you know, thinner in between. And just, just let's be very pragmatic. Look at the, uh, if you look at the unicorns, uh, you know, for example, in Europe, look at the numbers of unicorns you're going to find, uh, you know, in Northern Europe compared to Southern Europe. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> um, it, it, it tells everything, um, I think. Sharon, do you have some questions there? Yeah, I'll just throw, I think it's probably best now to throw them all out and see if anybody has a specific uh, one they would like to uh, answer to. Um, what, uh, so one of our attendees would like to know, uh, have more light shed on how they can attract VCs into Nigeria. Uh, there's a question about Ireland, uh, how the Ireland play is adding to you uh, from or how Ireland compares to the USA taxes and also to other, um, other European countries, I imagine. And then if uh, before a company succeeds in the US market, is your advice not to access the European and UK markets or even other markets? And how is that beneficial for startup companies if so? Uh, let me go up here. Do you, do you mean, uh, they, the question is, because you said we we could we could answer right away. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, the, if the question is, should we go to Europe before being successful in the U.S.? Possibly, yeah. Uh, I would say no. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> Please don't do that. Uh, you know, too yeah. complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. And we right. have a question re relative to the current COVID triggered recession. Um, if it sustains, how would that potentially affect EU and UK-based private equity? Is it smart, smart for LA startups to diverse, diversify fundraising overseas, or would private equity face wider risks overseas before it does in the US? So speaking, again, same point for trying to raise in Europe, why you're not successful in the US, yeah, it's going to be difficult. Uh, so, but but talking about COVID, uh, I'll, I'm, you know, I, I will let James for for UK because I'm not 100% sure. But but definitely uh, looking at France again uh, and and some other countries, it's 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 pretty obvious. The sovereign banks are doing a lot, and um, and uh, and they they're making sure you know most of the funds are still raising money. Uh, and so there, there's uh, so there, there's 
already a lot of money because you get you got a lot of it's same in the US for, for that so a lot of funds raised a lot of money before so mm -hmm. there's a lot of dry powder uh, already in the game but what we can see and what we can tell and 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 this is also as I was just saying uh, the sovereign bank is doing a lot for that uh, the funds are still raising funds uh, even more I would say than uh, the startups are raising money, so which is pretty good for the long run. Uh, even if I would not be the, the most optimistic uh, <laughs> person here for what's going to be uh, 2021, so, you know, I think the, the, the economic crisis is going to be is going to be pretty deep. Uh, but talking about ability to raise money, it will be still there, um, and uh, for that specific reason uh, in Europe. Sovereign bank are very important. That's what I mean. Absolutely. In the UK, so last year, London companies raised just under 10 billion uh, pounds. Uh, and this year, from January to May, uh, UK companies have raised about 5.3 billion. That was a report that came out this week because this week is London Tech Week in, uh, uh, in London. I'd encourage you to all join tomorrow morning. The time difference doesn't help, but Hillary Clinton is speaking tomorrow morning. Uh, <laughs> part of London Tech Week. So money is being raised in London. It was interesting actually last year, I know this is kind of US to London, but uh, Silicon Valley or, or West Coast VCs, uh, US VCs uh, invested $4.4 billion into UK tech companies last year. That's an incredible amount. That's a big proportion. So VCs mm -hmm. increasingly, I think, looking at how they can invest overseas. I think, you know, before it was really, really difficult. And I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be easy now, but you know, we've had LA VCs like Clock Tower Ventures, like Fifth Wall, place people in, in London. You know, they're actively looking in London. You know, so I know that's more US and West Coast to London rather than Europe to West Coast. But I think it just shows that, you know, it, it's the nature of investment is changing as well. And, and then you've also got other ways. You've got the AIM market in London, which is the alternative investment market, you know, for earlier stage companies looking to raise on public exchanges. So there are lots of different opportunities to explore, I think. Mm -hmm. And we have one last question about um, a skin, uh, a skincare product, cosmetic skincare product, looking forward to being in the UK and the European market and what's the best way to access this market and who can help us. So maybe Lava can answer that. <laughs> Join Lava, <laughs> pull our members. <laughs> Well, I've actually worked on this space, and I can tell you the <clears throat> labeling and the European consumer in cosmetics and skincare is much more discerning than the American customer. So really, um, if you're going to launch in Europe, have a very natural product and look at the labeling. Okay. Yes, the regulatory bodies uh, are also, also more. So uh, we're... Um, Right, uh, right after six o'clock. So I just want to thank everybody. Uh, I don't know, and I apologize if we have those questions collected. Uh, if I can, I will make the introductions to the panelists who may be able to help answer those questions, and I'll certainly do it as well, um, and maybe even double them up or triple them up, because uh, we all have differing opinions. I, you know, Alfred, I. I believe if you're going to go ahead and spend 110% of your effort and your time and your money and your blood and your sweat and your tears to launch here to 300, if, you know, particularly let's say a, a CPG, why not go for what, 330 million people here? Why not go into Europe with 700 and some million, you know, more than double your, your potential, potential market, but maybe that's too cavalier. I, well, I don't cut the checks. So I mean, I guess that's probably <laughs> why. Um, but anyway, um, so if I can get to these questions, we'll, we'll do our best to uh, answer it. Uh, I want to thank all you guys. I'm going to turn it over to Darren to, uh, to wrap it up. All right, Darren, taking pictures of the questions so that we have them to save once the, uh, <laughs> once the webinar goes. I think we lose the questions. Um, just to wrap it up, uh, thank you for everyone for attending. It seems like a majority, 75% uh, of you all responded to the poll. Thank you. As you were looking at it, uh, it was pretty clear most of the folks uh, in attendance were in LA. Um, most of you had B2B startups at the seed stage and um, are focused on the US and the EU uh, specifically. I think it was 60% uh, 
um, of the respondents were, uh, were uh, there was a multiple choice and you can answer multiple times, but it was uh, EU and US. So um, thank you everyone, the panelists, fantastic. I was getting text messages from folks uh, complimenting us on the quality of the panel. So especially for a first time out. So uh, thank you, Brenda, James, uh, and Alfred. Um, great job, Sharon and, and Michael. And um, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, stay safe and uh, look forward to more uh, lava, global lava in particular um, webinars. Thank you, everyone.